What's up, Oakland? Uh, I just wanted to introduce very quickly um, somebody that is a really amazing person, an incredible theoretician, writer, and activist on issues of feminism, anti-capitalism, and indigenous issues, an amazing friend of mine, a comrade, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz. I am unfortunately a writer who reads what I write. Um, so I, I'm really honored to be here and thank you so much for being here as well. This land, don't you feel it? Doesn't it make you want to go out and lift dead Indians tenderly from their graves to steal from them? as if it must be clinging to their corpses. Authenticity. Authenticity. Those are the words of poet William Carlos Williams. We stand here today on the land of the Ohlone and honor this earth in which their ancestors are buried and the descendants of genocide continue their struggle. Under the crust of the earth that is called the United States of America, from California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land is not yours and mine. There are in turn the bones, villages, fields, and sacred items of Indians whose living descendants of the survivors try, cry out for the interred to be heard, for their story of what happened to be told, because it is the truth. They are truly the undead and carry the memories of how the United States of America was founded and how it came to be as it is today, having made the whole world Indian country. It should not have happened that the great civilizations of the Western Hemisphere the very evidence of the Western Hemisphere would be wantonly destroyed. The progress of humanity interrupted and on the path and put on the path of greed and destruction. Choices were made that forged that path of destruction of life itself, the moment in which we live now. It is no longer a choice to know this history, rather a requirement for survival. Its name is capitalism, its method is colonialism and imperialism. So how do we destroy this evil that is capitalism, which found its center in what is now called the United States? I think the founding of the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW or Wobblies, at the beginning of the last century in 1905, gave us a roadmap that is expressed in the preamble to their constitution. The working class and the employing class have nothing in common. There can be no peace so long as hunger and want are found among the millions of the working people. And the few who make up the employing class have all the good things in life. Between these two classes, a struggle must go on until the workers of the world organize as a class, take possession of the means of production, abolish the wage system, and live in harmony with the earth. We find that the centering of the management of industries into fewer and fewer hands makes the trade unions, this was 1905 mainly, mind you, the trade unions unable to cope with the ever-growing power of the employing class. The trade unions foster a state of affairs which allows one set of workers to be pitted against another set of workers in the same industry, thereby helping defeat one another in wage wars. Moreover, the trade unions aid the employing class to mislead the workers into the belief that the working class have interests in common with their employers. These conditions can be changed and the interest of the working class upheld only by an organization formed in such a way that all its members, 
in any one industry or on all industries, if necessary, cease work whenever a strike or lockout is on in any department, thereof thus making an injury to one, an injury to all. <clears throat> Instead of a cons the conservative motto, a fair day's wage for a fair day's work, we must inscribe on our banner the revolutionary watchword, abolition of the wage system. It is the historic mission of the working class to do away with capitalism and build a new society within the shell of the old. I think those words express the spirit of this movement, particularly Occupy Oakland, which by the way is known all over the world now. I happen to be traveling to Europe and all over in October and November and everyone asked me where I was from, and I said, San Francisco. And they said, isn't that near Oakland? <laughs> you put Oakland on the map for a great reason. It hasn't been there since the Black Panther Party. <clears throat> so I want to read a short piece I wrote a few years ago. I think you'll see why the Occupy movement makes my heart sing why recognizing the ex existence of 1% as the enemy is the doorway to the future, if there is to be a future. It's called Hating the Rich. The rich are not like you and me, wrote F. Scott Fitzgerald. Christian preachers intone, the poor will always be with us, so be charitable. Get real, accept it. Humans by nature are selfish, we are told. Give alms and aid to the poor. Tax the rich, but let them stay rich. Establish private foundations to avoid the taxes and manipulate our movements. Be a responsible trust baby and give, rather than just becoming a revolutionary. You've heard it all and maybe even believe it in your heart, but it's toxic thinking. I have a suggestion for clarifying our consciousness. Learn to hate the rich. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hate, yes. You can dress up the language and call it rage, but hate is a concept that's greatly under underrated. Everyone does it, but no one wants to admit it. Usually hating the wrong person, often hating oneself. Hate is the opposite of love. Do you love the rich? Like the rich? If not, then maybe you can learn to hate the rich. And I don't, I don't mean to shame the rich in order to get money out of their guilt, as been a, has been a long practice on the left and among nonprofits. I mean not taking money from the rich. Isolate the rich. Don't allow them to soothe their consciousness by giving money and getting huge tax breaks in the process. Force them to build tall walls around their estates and corporate headquarters as the people force the rich to do in Latin America. Imprison them in their walls. How dare they be allowed to have plate glass windows? Look at them on their corporate headquarters and mansions. We are held back and diminished by the claim that hating is bad for us, bad for everyone, that we all are part of the human family. You can hate the person's action, but not hate the person. You can hate wealth or capitalism, but not the rich. It's an absurd logic that keeps us hating and blaming ourselves for not being rich and powerful. In a way, it's not consistent. It's all right to hate slavery and slave owners, fascism and Hitler, why not hate the rich, the individual rich, not an abstract concept such as a corporation. Name names, look them up. They're available online. But who are the rich? We have to be careful about that, living in a country that does not admit to class, and class is a subject to little analysis. Talking about class is said to be divisive, Identifying the rich is not only a matter of income, and it is essential in hating the rich to target the enemy and not some front for the enemy, such as police, politicians. 
High income can certainly make people full of themselves and obnoxious, and most U.S. citizens who live on high fixed income or hourly incomes due to circumstances, say of a good trade union or a professional degree, have no idea that they aren't rich. In polls, the majority of U.S. populations say they are in the top fifth of the income bracket, and they aren't. They aren't even near there. A majority of U.S. citizens don't want to tax the rich more and don't hate the rich because they think they themselves will be rich one day. They won't. It's an insidious lie. They're prisoners of democracy. The rich own not just a mortgaged house and a car, a boat, or a cabin in the woods, or a beach house. Rather, they own you, us. They own the government, the police, the state. And it's not new. It's always been the truth of capitalism. Just because we are waking up doesn't mean that things were better in the past. Even the cash and luxury-soaked entertainment and sports uh, industry and sports stars are not the rich. They certainly deserve contempt and disgust sometimes, but not hatred. Don't go for scapegoats. Jews, Oprah, Mar Martha Stewart or any of the things that represent such people who are out in the open. Most of the rich are very quiet and are not in the headlines. Hatred should be reserved for those who own us, that is, those who own the banks, the oil companies, the war industry, and the land and corporate agriculture, indigenous land the private universities and prep schools, and who own the foundations that dole out to worthy projects for the poor and for public institutions, their opera, their ballet, their symphony that you are allowed to attend for a high price after opening night. My oldest brother, who like me grew up dirt poor in rural Oklahoma, children of sharecroppers, he rebuts my arguments and he buys into the idea that anyone can get rich. And he's not. He's poor. But he says no poor man ever gave him a job. That says it all. The rich own him and us. Why are we silent about this? Grumping over increase in the income gap, trying to figure out how to narrow it. What do we expect? That the rich will empower the people to overthrow them as they almost did in response to the labor movement in the 1930s or the civil rights movement and the war on poverty. Not again will the ruling class make that mistake because we got energized. The people got energized in the 30s. They were winning. I'm not saying we shouldn't point to income gaps and, and to all of the statistics that are necessary and also try to improve things wherever we can. But we need to stop longing for the return of the New Deal or a wealthy savior such as Franklin Roosevelt. My sharecropper father, son of a wobbly himself, always taught me that Roosevelt had rescued the rich and saved capitalism, and he was right. Passionate, just as Obama is saving capitalism right now. Passionate, organized hatred is the element missing in all that we do to try to change the world. Now is the time to spread hate. So that's what I wrote uh, a few years ago. And now here we are in the convergence of the 99% against the 1%. You are the people and the movement that we've been waiting for. The other side of coming out, coming, the other side of coming, of, of, coming to have a cold, hard hatred for the 1%, the rich, is to love the people. For the 99% for ourselves, the arguments and criticisms might be loving and compassionate. The two sides are intricately linked. The 1% is hatred and the love of the 99%, our own love and our struggles within. We have a long, hard road ahead. I want to close by quoting my great hero, Lucy Parsons, wife of the Haymarket martyr, Albert Parsons. She herself was a labor militant 50 years on after 
Albert was hung. Speaking in 1905 at the founding of the Industrial Workers of the World, Lucy Parsons said, My conception of the strike of the future is not to strike and go out and starve, but to strike and remain and take possession of the necessary property of production. Do you think the capitalists will allow you to vote away their property? You may, but I do not believe it. It means a revolution that shall turn all these things over. To the wealth producers, when you, which are us, when your new economic organization, the Wobblies, shall declare as brothers and sisters that you are determined that you possess these things, then there is no army that is large enough to overcome you, for you yourself constitute the army. On another occasion, Lucy Parsons, herself an African-American, advised a black community in Jim Crow, Mississippi, this was in the 1920s, to respond to white supremacist massacres of their friends and families. She said, you are not absolutely defenseless, none of us are, for the torch of the incendiary, which has been known to show murderers and tyrants the danger line, beyond which they may not venture with impunity, cannot be wrested from you. Lucy, Mar uh, Lucy Parsons struck a match and held it up as a symbol of freedom. You may not have to use it, but we have the power and the right to do so. You are free people spreading freedom. Thank you.